Thank you, Sabina. I, um, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, I want to thank the Academy for the invitation um, so that I can speak here tonight. Um, showing and speaking in this very famous and important Academy and in this city is very meaningful to me. Um, some of my dearest friends and most co respected colleagues are in this room tonight. Um, there are also ex-students here, and there is the love of my life. Um, thank you so much for being there. Um, I have had the privilege of being able to work in this city since over 20 years. Um, in these years, I forged meaningful professional relationships with Belvedere, with the MAC, with the Kunsthalavin, with the Galeries Cargo and Maya Kainer, and with Mumok, where in two weeks my film, my film Mandarin Ducks will be on show as part of their collection presentation. Um, at the Gemilde Gallery here, um, in this academy, you can currently see my installation Bouquet 4 that Sabina just referenced. Um, it, the end that was indeed, indeed first installed for the double solo that Jeroen de Rijke and I staged together with Christopher Williams at the Sensation in 2005. Um, and like 18 years ago, it was this week installed by the skillful florists of the local flower store Blumenkraft, um, a, um, a company I really love to work with, with a fantastic name, I think. Um, the main text for the small publication named King Vulture that we were able to produce in the framework of this exhibition, um, like the very first substantial text about my work from the year 2000, was written by Vanessa Joan Muller, who is also in this audience. Um, for a living artist and any institution to work together is never easy for both parties. Um, and if that institution has the task of guarding a world-renowned collection of old art, processes are even more likely to be slow and challenged. Sabine Foli is not only a very knowledgeable and intelligent and inspired curator, um, she's also a very effective manager with a great sense of humor. Um, I am really deeply grateful that you and your fantastic team were brave enough to give me carte blanche and to develop a new installation and a publication with me. Thank you very much, Sabine. Um, I want to thank the tech team here tonight for making it possible that I can speak and that you can all hear and see me. Thank you very much um, for your service. It's much appreciated. You make it very easy on me. Um, my name is Willem de Roy. Um, I go with the pre pronouns he and him. I was born in the Netherlands in 1969, um, and I was trained in Amsterdam in the late and middle 1990s. I am a visual artist and an educator. I analyze the genealogy and the contextualization of images um, through very different media. I teach and I mentor in very different institutions. I am a professor at the Stedelschule in Frankfurt um, and an advisor at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. Um, and I founded a postgrad level mentoring uh, program named the Berlin Program for Artists in the city where I live, Berlin, together with my colleagues Angela Bullock and Simon Denny. I am in academia not because I want to teach, but because I want to communicate. I, so I don't really consider myself a talented lecturer, and um, I prefer to learn together with others through conversation. So please interrupt me during this talk. Um, if you have any questions. Um, this is also why, uh, instead of education, I prefer to speak of exchange. Notions of exchange also fuel my artistic work. Um, my first and longest collaboration began in art school, um, where I met my collaborative partner Jeroen de Rijke on the first day. Um, so I became an artist through collaboration, and I learned how to make art through collaboration. Uh, and since then, I have collaborated in many different ways and different forms. My works are, besides many things, uh, reflections on exchange, on learning, on assisting, and on appropriation. Where does collaboration turn into abuse? 
when does appropriation become theft? Um, today, I will try to condense this talk that I prepared for you in about 70 minutes. I will talk about four projects. Um, three are established and one is in progress. Um, these projects speak of different forms of exchange. Um, in, and in all these works, I make use of historical material. And these appropriated objects for me speak about the past, but they also mirror the present. After four years of research into two groups of objects um, that both have a place in the collection of the state museums in Berlin, um, I decided to bring these objects together in a comparative visual analysis, thinking of who collects what and why, um, and how are these objects shown. On the left hand, you see an image of Kuku Ilimoku, an 18th century Hawaiian sculpture. Kuku Ilimoku, um, is the god of war uh, in pre-contact uh, Hawaii. Um, this object um, is made of basketry um, that is covered in uh, with a net um, that is worked, uh, um, elaborated with birds' feathers. Um, so the area that is pink on this face or reddish um, is made by the feathers of little birds. These birds are called o'os. Um, the eyes are made of um, shells, and the hair is human hair. And the dogs, the, the, the teeth are dogs' teeth. And on the right-hand side, um, you see a painting made by Melchior de Hondekoeter, um, an artist uh, who worked in the Netherlands in the 17th century. Um, he painted only birds. Um, these birds find themselves in situations of stress and conflict um, in usually very confined pictorial spaces. Um, the image that you see here is called Dead Cock. Um, I find that title interesting because it talks about uh, the bird that is on the ground rather than the bird that is most central in this, um, in this depiction. Um, both these works are in the, co in the collection of the State Museums of Berlin. Um, and when I uh, started to investigate both these groups of objects, because both the objects that you see here are uh, exemplary of uh, uh, yeah, a larger group um, of sculptures from Hawaii and paintings from the Netherlands. Um, I uh, noticed that they are connected um, uh, that they are both objects that depict and indicate status and that they are connected to territorial and economical battles and stories of migration, um, and that these objects visualize concepts of moral and religious superiority in relation to exoticized others. And um, the deeper I uh, started to understand what these groups of objects are, um, the more there was to learn about them and what connected them and also what set them apart. And because the materiality of these objects was so different, it was not really possible for me to compare them effectively on the basis of images, and that's why I decided to attempt to bring the actual objects together in one space, um, and I was given that opportunity in 2010 um, uh, by the then director of uh, the National Gallery in Berlin, Udo Kittelmann, with whom I produced uh, the exhibition Intolerance that started in 2010 um, into 2011. Um, the Neue National Gallery um, in Berlin, as many of you will know, uh, was built in 1968 by Mies van der Rohe. This is a building that contains, as you can see, no walls, making it quite hard for anyone to show anything in it. Um, so um, we had to produce a rather elaborate display system in order to bring uh, the objects that we wanted to uh, combine and compare uh, together in that room. Um, um, a display system uh, that made it possible for the paintings to hang and for the feathered objects from Hawaii to um, uh, uh, be protected from uh, changes, changes in climate and light. Um, uh, we also had to cover the windows with a protective shield in order to filter the light even further. Um, 
And this display module, uh, this box that you see at the lower end of this uh, page, um, has two sides, so it was possible to walk around it um, and in this way, uh, yeah, kind of follow a narrative as if it was a film strip or a, 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 an area of a Google image, if you wish, um, where it was possible to to compare both the the sculptures and the and the the flat objects, the paintings. In the middle here, you see a painting that is at home at the Louvre in Paris. Um, and on the left-hand side, a, a feathered cape um, that was worn by Hawaiian chiefs originally. These capes uh, were made for specific individuals and could not be inherited. And that's why uh, after uh, such a person who would, uh, a chief or high-ranking official, um, after such a person would pass away, uh, it would become possible for these objects to travel. And of course, um, the provenance uh, around these objects is, uh, as it is uh, so usual with almost all the ethnographic objects that we know, uh, the um, provenance is contested and complex. Um, but many of these capes were uh, actually exchanged in diplomatic exchanges um, and given away um, because they could not have a function um, in uh, the different uh, societies and cultures that at that moment uh, constituted Hawaii, which was at that moment not yet a, um, uh, a unified state, but a number of island states um, that battled each other for, um, uh, for territory and uh, resources. Um, the objects on the right-hand side uh, are at home in the... Um, uh, National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. These capes and also these feathered heads were carried around in processions and worn in uh, situations um, of uh, diplomatic or political uh, uh, exchange and um, uh, communication. Um, the capes are woven and they are made with threads that are made of plant fiber. And this plant fiber is twined. Is that how you say it? So it's like uh, they are being um, uh, turned into threads. And while they are being turned, there are birds' feathers being worked into the thread so that they become fluffy threads, all right? And then these threads are being woven into a structure that becomes either a cape or a net that can be pulled over a basket, and the basket has the shape of a head. Um, and during this production of these threads, chants are being sung, and these chants were believed to uh, yeah, electrify these objects or produce, um, I, uh, I was raised in a secular family, I have difficulties talking about um, religious uh, procedures, but I, I always, give it my best. Um, I think that these um, uh, chants um, would produce um, or establish a relationship of, between the object and um, the ancestors, I would assume. This is what I've learned or uh, which what I understood. Um, on this page or, or on this slide, you can see how it became possible to compare these objects. Um, whether or not this comparison was fruitful or what it would then bring uh, or what even would be the core of that comparison is still a question that is open to debate also for me, I have to say. Um, it's interesting because often people think, and uh, I'm talking here to a room full of artists, so you know what I'm talking about. People think that we know everything about the work that we make. Um, for those of you who are not artists, I can tell you that that is not usually the case. So we have ideas that we want to execute or investigate. And at the moment that a piece is finished, um, begins a whole new process of getting to know what actually happened, what have you made, what, what, what happened, yeah? And um, these are two very different processes that are both very interesting. And um, in the case of this exhibition, I'm still, uh, and many of the works that I have made, I'm still kind of digesting um, what it is that I have produced. And um, that's always like an interesting process that also uh, produces new work and new ideas. Um, here you have a closer view of the objects that come from the National Museum in 
Denmark. I said before that these objects are at home there. That is, of course, to be disputed, obviously. Um, who knows where these objects are at home at this moment? After everything that happened, um, what do we know? Um, this work by Melchior de Hondekoeter is interesting um, because um, other than the work Dead Cock that you saw before, um, this work named um, The Floating Feather uh, depicts birds that were local to the Netherlands at the moment when this work was made in the late 1700s, um, but it also depicts birds that were imported. And the imported birds uh, came from uh, to the Netherlands via different trade routes that were organized um, by the trade companies uh, named the VOC and the VIC, the Western and the Eastern uh, Dutch uh, trade companies um, that were appara commercial apparatuses uh, that served uh, the colonial regime um, and that extracted uh, goods and services um, from occupied territories overseas. Um, Indonesia, uh, the Dutch Antilles, um, and Suriname, uh, a small country um, in South America next to Venezuela. Um, this painting is uh, popular with the population of Amsterdam. They called it the floating feather. Um, as many of you know, um, uh, paintings did not always uh, and not usually have titles uh, back in the days, back in those days. Um, the floating feather is a popular title that was given by the Dutch um, Amsterdam-based audiences that um, that liked this piece and still like this piece. Um, I was able, um, in the context of the exhibition Intolerance in Berlin, to bring three um, uh, family members of this painting into the same room. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, a um, they, these are four works from public collections in Europe. On the left-hand side, a work from Berlin. Um, no. I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, a work from Ghent, um, and then uh, next to it, uh, a work from Berlin, then one from Budapest, and then on the right-hand side, the work from Amsterdam. Um, of course, I was terribly excited to be able to um, compare these four works because I uh, had suspected at the at the moment when I started to do this research this is something that happens rather often in my, my practice I become interested in uh, some form or object and I want to know more about it and um, then sometimes it turns out there is not really any literature about it so it's hard for me to find information. It was the same with the works of Melchior de Hondekoeter, a rather well-known artist in the Netherlands where I grew up, but strangely oh. enough, not somebody about whom uh, yeah, any substantial catalog was ever made. Um, same was true for the uh, feathered objects of Hawaii, um, very well-known and, uh, and uh, 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 objects that many people are interested in, people have invested in, people have studied, um, but no serious catalog was ever produced. Um, and through my research and looking at like different images of the work of the Hondekoeter, I suspected that these pelicans were all the same size. I thought they must have been painted by the same hand, possibly on the basis of a mold or like a, how would you call that if you cut out a form, a stencil, a, a stencil, a stencil form. Okay. something like that. Um, I think we could say on the basis of this uh, installation that that has been the case. And at the same time, you can see that the other areas of these paintings were probably made by different people, so that many different hands worked on these works. And that was something that really excited me, that I liked about the work of the Hondekoeter, um, uh, the fact that these are not uh, works that are made by one uh, genius, um, but that they are a group effort in the same way that these uh, woven objects uh, made in Hawaii uh, are uh, only possible to be made um, if there's a, a highly specialized uh, yeah, proto-industrial production process at work where different groups of people with different skills come together. If somebody is orchestrating all this and all these skills, uh, yeah, you have to be able to, if, if you want to produce uh, an, Hawaiian, uh, an Hawaiian god, uh, figure head, you have to be able to produce baskets, uh, fish, uh, catch birds, kill them, pluck them, uh, produce threads, weave, 
um, et cetera. Um, so a whole, a whole number of different skulls, skills has to be coordinated. Um, same goes for these paintings of Melchior de Hondekoeter made by different people, something interesting for me um, as an artist, but also a collaborator. Um, on this slide, you can see in the middle a work by Melchior de Hondekoeter that was not in the show at the Neue National Gallery because it's in a private collection um, in the United States. Um, the works that we showed at the National Gallery all came from, from public collections. Um, 18 paintings and 12 feathered objects. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a work by an artist named Adrian Korte. Um, this is in the Ashmolean, Ashmolean collections in London. Um, so is the work on the right, by the way. Um, the work by Korte on the left is rather small. It's a tiny little work, but you recognize obviously the pelican. And on the right-hand side, um, uh, you will recognize the cockatoo. Interestingly, a work made by an artist named Willem van Rooyen. And uh, both Willem van Rooyen and Adrian Korte were assistants and students of uh, Melchior de Hondekoeter working in his studio. But here you can see that they also used motifs um, that are uh, that the Hondekoeter is known for uh, in their own work and signed them with their own name. So this kind of fluidity of authorship is something that really excited me and, uh, and, and interests me. Um, I learned uh, some new things um, this week uh, through working together with Claudia Koch um, in this um, wonderful institution, the Gemilde Gallery, um, here in the Academy. Um, Claudia, a, a very uh, skillful and knowledgeable um, art historian, um, taught me about a number of works in the collection here that are also on display um, that are signed by different artists, interestingly. So another kind of uh, yeah, focus on togetherness, uh, on uh, collaboration, uh, where the different authors are actually named and marketed on the same work. Very interesting, I thought. Um, in the framework of this exhibition, we were able to produce three catalogues that came together in one box. One is a um, catalogue raisonné of the, all of the feathered objects from Hawaii that are known to us today, written by Adrian Kepler. Um, she was um, a uh, curator at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu since the 1960s, where she started to work on this manuscript. And miraculously, in the framework of this um, exhibition, we were... Um, able uh, or had the honor to be able to um, publish this manuscript. That is the volume about Hawaiian featherwork. The volume about Melchior de Hondekoeter I monitored. This is not a catalogue raisonné, but lists 200 works of the Hondekoeter in uh, public collections world worldwide. Um, and the volume uh, named Intolerance talks about the exhibition um, and the installation. Um, Juliane Rebentisch writes about my work in her brilliant, incredible way. Um, Adrian Kepler on the right-hand side, um, as I said, wrote the volume about um, Hawaiian featherwork. And Isanne Wepler and Marachie Ricke both wrote uh, different chapters on the work of Melchior de Hondekoeter. I will say a couple of words about a project I uh, finalized uh, two years ago, centered around the work of um, the photographer Pierre Verger, um, who is a queer artist um, and an academic, um, who was born uh, in Paris in 1902 and passed away in Salvador de Bahia in 1996. Verger became a press photographer um, in the 1930s in Europe, um, started to travel all over the world um, and ended up in 1945 in Salvador de Bahia um, in the north of Brazil um, and uh, from that place he started to uh, uh, travel um, the African continent and um, Afro-diasporic communities worldwide in order to scan uh, cultural uh, similarities and differences between the continent and the diasporic communities, um, very much focusing on religious rituals. Um, Verger became a self-taught ethnographer in that sense. Um, he became also a professor at the University of Ife in Nigeria and wrote a dissertation 
um, at the Sorbonne uh, in the 1960s named Flux and Reflux, um, talking about this contact and this traffic between the motherland, if you wish, a little, what a clumsy word, the continent, um, and uh, the different diasporas, and back again. So that is exactly very interesting about this book is that it talks about traffic in two directions, um, which from a Brazilian perspective was a lot more normal, I think, and usual. And there's a lot more, um, uh, yeah, let's say precedents for that and examples of that than, for instance, from a Surinamese perspective, a perspective that I know a little bit more about um, because of growing up in the Netherlands. Um, I spent some time in Salvador de Bahia, um, in uh, 2018 and became aware of the work of um, of Pierre Verger. Um, his archive is there. He left around 60,000 um, negatives when he passed away in the 1990s, and these are uh, very well kept um, in the archive that also used to be his home and studio. Um, and there is a convolute of images that he produced in Suriname, the former Dutch colony in um in uh, South America. Um, in 1948, he traveled there for a short time, a couple of weeks, uh, and produced a group of 257 images, half of them in the capital of that country named Paramaribo, and the other half um, in the forest um, where maroon societies uh, uh, have lived um, ever since. Uh, yeah, these societies, as you, as you know, come out of um, runaway slaves, enslaved West Africans who um, had to work on uh, Dutch-owned um, sugar plantations um, and um, uh, managed to make their way into the jungle and found societies over there where particular habits and uh, cultural traits um, uh, remained intact uh, over centuries even until today. Um, Pierre Verger was interested in religious um, rituals that happened in these um, maroon societies in the in the forest, um, and um, and set out to uh, photograph Suriname society. In, um, in 1948, he produced these 257 images in two weeks' time. Um, they depict the people of Paramaribo and how do they use the city, uh, how do they live, how do they move around. Um, Verger was somebody who liked to compare images, um, so he uh, used to bring photos that he made, uh, for instance, in the African mainland to diasporic communities, and um, these photos made in Wanhati on this trip to Suriname, uh, interestingly show this process. So on the left-hand side you can see um, this uh, boy who is looking at a photo um, that was most likely taken in a very different cultural sphere. Um, and Verger would uh, 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 write down the responses of people to the images they see. Um, the moment he actually came for um, happened at the end of his trip of two weeks' time, where he uh, witnessed um, a number of uh, nocturnal rituals um, in the city of Wanhati. Um, he wrote about this photo session um, that must have made an impression on him because he ran out of photo material and got into a fight with the local community. So this is like a, a short description that we have of this of this moment. Um, I was interested in these um, images because I had never seen them. There is not a lot of photographic material uh, made in Suriname um, that is n a little bit different from the usual... Um, how do I say this? Like a Western centric uh, uh, proto scientific uh, paternalistic gla glare, stance, gaze. Um, Verger is a little different. He photographs no colonial rulers. Um, so he only photographs inhabitants and they are not usually staged. So what you see is people who are actually doing their, going around their daily business. And what Verger really does is um, he glamorizes his subjects, whether it's in Bahia or anywhere else. Um, and whether these folks are brown or uh, black or white, he will glamorize any, any of his subjects. Um, and this made him quite popular in Brazil um, amongst Afro-Brazilian Afro communities in the 
the 1950s un until almost today, um, because there were not many photographers and uh, yeah, platforms where Afro-Brazilian communities would be depicted as uh, empowered and positive. Um, so this is something that worked for him and that worked for his models and his photos. On the other hand, of course, these photos do not show moments of hardship. Uh, they also don't show moments of protest. Um, they don't show why and how these communities are marginalized. So um, there is something to be said about that. And there is something said about that nowadays. Obviously, there is more critique on this way of working than there was before. Um, but there's also still a lot of support and there's love for the for the work that Verge did. So it's a uh, it's it's not a simple story in that sense. Um, I asked around um, amongst uh, friends and specialists, uh, uh, knowing about uh, yeah the image production uh, in and around and coming out of Suriname um, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, whether they knew about this work and whether they thought it would be purposeful to publish it. Um, I was. Uh, yeah, I received positive feedback. Um, so I decided to produce a book around this work um, so that broader audience could have their way with it and study it and uh, uh, yeah, come to their own conclusions about these images. And I also produced an exhibition um, at the um, uh, Kunsthalle Porticus in Frankfurt um, where I um, installed um, these images as a slideshow. Um, uh, so this is a back projection and uh, the 257 images uh, come by in succession in the way that they were found in the archive of Pierre Verger. Um, you know how, yeah, when you show slides in a classical slide projector, you will, so when one slide follows the next, you will hear a click. Um, and you don't only hear a click, but you also see a flash, right? You see a short black moment, a short dark moment. Um, and this installation at the moment, it, it looks a little bit like a slideshow in the sense that these images follow each other. But the moment that that click and that black flash would happen is when this, this screen turns into a mirror. Um, so in the end, what this installation does is you see 257 images by Pierre Verger, um, images of um, Suriname, and 257 reflections of yourself uh, and the institution. We produced um, the book that comes um, with this installation, uh, together with a number of writers. Um, Karin Amat Mukrim um, is a Dutch Surinamese writer who focuses on, um, uh, yeah, let's say, the complex constellation of, uh, of Suriname society that is a very creolized uh, society that consists of different cultural and ethnic groups um, that are both um, mixing and uh, intensely segregated. Um, Ayason Heraclito is a um, Afro-Brazilian artist and writer. Um, he's a queer activist and also a Candomblé priest, just like Pierre Verger. Candomblé, uh, the uh, Afro-Brazilian um, uh, religion. Um, I asked Ayerson to write a biography of Pierre Verger, which he did in an incredible way. It's very, very beautiful text. On the right-hand side, you see um, Richard and Sally Price, um, a, a pair of uh, American ethnographers who lived in the Surinamese jungle since the 1970s, uh, writing about uh, maroon cultures, material culture, um, but also contemporary political movements around these cultures having to do with uh, yeah, the infringements of their, uh, uh, of their societies through, um, uh, uh, how do you call this, like mineral digging in the forest, in the jungle, um, excavation of um, Bodenschätze. What is English for Bodenschätze? Um, The riches of the earth. <coughs> How I'm sorry, I have no, I um, have no word for this. Um, uh, Gloria Wecker 
Resources, yes, exactly. Um, Gloria Wecker um, is a um, Dutch Surinamese um, sociologist, um, an enormously important uh, figure in the Netherlands. Um, she conceptualized uh, the notion of white innocence um, in the Netherlands, um, talking about um, race relations in that country. Um, she wrote a text for this book uh, about same-sex relations in the Surinamese jungle, a topic that she started working on in the 1960s when she was a young academic. Um, very interesting and unexpected contribution to this book. And Philippe Perrot, um, who was also the curator of this exhibition, um, wrote about my work um, in, uh, in the framework of this installation. A project that is in development and um, of which branches are, um, uh, are uh, have now landed in this building um, that, that I'm very excited about because this um, this project that um, Sabine and I developed uh, here uh, made it possible for me to further my research um, yeah, that has to do with the work of Dirk Valkenburg. Dirk, Dirk Valkenburg, um, born in Amsterdam in 1675 and um, who died there in 1721. Dirk Valkenburg was a student um, of... Um, uh, of Jan Wenix um, and of um, uh, um, um, of Michiel Mussaert. Um, he um, traveled to uh, to Frankfurt, to Liechtenstein, um, and to Vienna. He was here on location. And the work of Dirk Falkenburg that you can see upstairs in the exhibition uh, was made on location here in Vienna for the Prince of Liechtenstein. Um, um, I'm showing you here images of three artists, Jan Wenix, Melchior de Hondekoeter and Dirk Valkenburg. Jan Wenix and Melchior de Hondekoeter, of whom you see works on the top of this page, were cousins. Um, so um, their parents were brother and sister. And um, uh, Wenix and Hondekoeter uh, were taught how to make art in the same studio. They were trained by the father of Jan Wenix. So they went through the same training as young boys. They started both to learn how to paint at a very young age and first assisted that father of Jan Wenix um, and then became artists in their own right. And because they were trained, I, I would assume, because they were trained in that same studio, um, uh, their works, uh, there are moments in the oeuvres of both these artists uh, that their works start to look really, really alike. And there are moments when it is even now for uh, specialists very difficult to tell these works apart, almost like um, the moment when uh, Picasso and Braque uh, were working in the same studio conceptualizing cubism. Um, this is how that worked, kind of. Um, and Dirk Falkenburg is a student of Jan Wenix. So he was a, an assistant and a student of Wenix. Um, uh, and uh, it is uh, these kind of um, yeah, uh, family, these close relations uh, between these two artists, both across generations and across uh, professions and across... Um, uh, uh, yeah, fa family and friendly uh, um, uh, relationships. Um, this is what interests me, these collaborations that happen in this way, um, but also the genre that they uh, uh, together uh, yeah, co-developed or further developed. We cannot say that any of them invented this genre, uh, which is a weird genre that... Um, uh, one would call the hunting still life, I would guess. Um, these are not always works where everything is still, as you can see. So they contain both dead and living animals uh, in all sorts of different um, constellations. I think maybe hunting still life is a work, uh, is a word that came about uh, through lack of a better word, because also not all these works always deal with hunting. Um, however, um, uh, this conceptualization of the hunt, um, uh, the um, dominance of humans over nature, over each other, over landscape, um, is something that is quite central to all these works. That is something that all their works propagate and depict. Um, and I 
would say that they all stand in the service of, uh, yeah, let's say the propaganda of of uh, white dominance, uh, of Dutch dominance in this case. Um, that I think is what would tie these positions, uh, amongst many other things. Um, here you can see an example of how close these forms can become. Um, on the top of the page you see a hair by Melchior de Hondekoeter on the left-hand side from a private collection. On the right-hand side, a hair by Jan Wenix from the Stedel Museum in Frankfurt. Um, and at the top of the page on the left, uh, a hair by Dirk Falkenburg from the Centraal Museum in Utrecht. And on the left, on the right hand side, another Falkenburg uh, from the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Um, what makes Dirk Falkenburg very different from the two other artists who were older, the other generation, is that they would uh, all depict fantasized landscapes. And these landscapes are uh, either inspired by by Italy or a fantasy of Italy or of another southern idealized uh, space. Um, and um, these landscapes are populated with fantasized people and fantasized buildings that are always quite grand. So there's an aspirational uh, uh, affect um, uh, attached to these uh, images. Um, and um, uh, Wenix and Hondekoeter are both artists that have never left Amsterdam. Um, so they had a lot to fantasize about. Um, um, Falkenburg, on the other hand, did leave. He did not only uh, 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 travel to, to Germany, and uh, as I said uh, here, he came to Austria, was in Vienna. Um, but he was at one point commissioned um, by an Amsterdam uh, industrial um, uh, mogul named Witsen uh, to travel to Suriname. And he did so in um, uh, 1708. Um, uh, and the uh, purpose of this trip was to depict um, the plantations that uh, Jonas Witsen owned in, um, in Suriname outside of Paramaribo. Um, and there was a small number of very important uh, works produced in that in a relatively short time um, that uh, Falkenburg spent in that Dutch colony. Um, so these uh, landscapes uh, depict the plantations and the fruits and uh, vegetables that grew there. Uh, there are animals depicted, there are inhabitants people depict it. There's architecture. Um, there's a number of drawings that are more like bookkeeping almost than uh, art, if you wish, in the way that we conceptualize art. Um, uh, this is all thought to give Jonas Witsen an impression of what he had bought because he was obviously the owner and stock, stock uh, main uh, uh, shareholder in this plantation enterprise. Um, um, this was a documentary mission, let's say. Um, in the framework of this uh, moment that Dirk Falkenberg, these, the couple of years that he spent in Suriname, he produced uh, an incredibly important work um, uh, that became uh, yeah, an iconic piece when it comes to uh, yeah, plantation iconography, if you wish, um, in the... Uh, in the Netherlands or Dutch uh, colonies and beyond. So I'm forgetting this slide here. Um, this is a image made in the Afro-Brazilian Museum in Sao Paulo, um, where also objects like this uh, sluice that you see here on the right-hand side, a machine built to make land dry, uh, very important in the Dutch psyche, uh, and that uh, importance was um, uh, uh, yeah, brought along into the colonies. Um, uh, the uh, colonial landscape of Suriname looks like a polder landscape, a Dutch landscape with uh, 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 
small canals uh, that irrigate the land, etc. Um, this machine that you see on the right hand side was used and operated by enslaved West Africans, but it was also built by them. And um, these objects um, that you see here in um, uh, that are exhibited in the Afro-Brazilian Museum in Sao Paulo show you some of these objects that are, uh, I thought, very interesting and important. Um, they are beautifully made um, and highly effective um, and really complex and uh, bitter riddles as an object because of their beauty, but also because of their function. Um, there are no images known to us that were made by enslaved people that lived on these uh, plantations. Um, we only have images made by uh, white visitors like Dirk Falkenburg um, or people who were even deeper involved in the, yeah, in the economy of these uh, companies. Um, so these objects really are, uh, for some periods of time, the only uh, material remnants um, of that other group of people that um, lived and worked on these plantations. Um, this work by Dirk Falkenberg is probably the only and uh, most important source that there is uh, that directly talks um, about um, uh, plantation life on a Dutch plantation in the early 1700s. Um, this work is at the um, Staten's Museum in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Um, it shows a so-called do. Um, this is a moment after work where enslaved people had a little bit of free time and um, could socialize. Um, this is um, a work that is obviously, um, um, it contains valuable information of uh, life on such a plantation. At the same time, of course, it is made uh, by a particular person with particular goggles on. And Dirk Falkenburg was deeply involved in the colonial regime, um, so had a particular stance. Um, nonetheless, this is a very uh, yeah, popular and um, uh, yeah, an interesting, interesting work um, that has been studied uh, through um, the decades, um, but um, again, about the work of Dirk Falkenberg, there is no uh, purposeful um, uh, catalog made. There was never a solo exhibition produced about this um, remarkable artist's work. Um, so this is something that I am working on. Um, and in um, 2025 um, at the Centraal Museum in Utrecht, I hope to be able to bring a number of his works um, together um, and also publish a book that I've been working on since 10 years. Um, these are four images that are representative of the work of Dirk Falkenberg after his return from Suriname back to the Netherlands. Um, these portraits look unremarkable and rather conservative on first glance. And I do think that they are. Dirk Falkenberg did not live very long anymore after returning from Suriname. He was very ill, uh, became very weak. Um, he um, made quite a large number of these before he passed away. But of course, um, what I'm very interested in is who these people are. Um, I do think that um, uh, studying uh, these um, uh, portraits uh, will make it possible for us to understand more about the networks uh, around Dirk Falkenberg um, uh, and understanding who facilitated the production of these images and these realities um, uh, and how. Um, so I'm looking forward to understand more about these portraits. This is a, um, a uh, an area of the work that I have not been able to get into uh, until now. Um, I'm working with an uh, editorial team. Um, on the right-hand side, you see Carmen Vatterblak, um, who is a um, uh, Kurdish-Iraqi uh, scholar who works at the Univers University of Leiden um, and is a... Uh, um, uh, the, the main voice um, uh, when it comes to investigating the history of slavery um, in and around 
the Netherlands. Um, and Matthias Dambold um, is a um, professor at the University of uh, Copenhagen. He um, uh, focuses on Nordic colonialism, so uh, uh, looking at uh, Greenland, uh, looking at Scandinavia, uh, but also like the uh, the Caribbean islands that were uh, occupied by Danish forces um, in the 17th, 18th century. Um, uh, we have started to work and we approached the first authors for this book. Um, so this, uh, yeah, this project is... Uh, is uh, is moving forward, very excited about it. Um, and again, um, to be able to show um, a work by Falkenberg in this exhibition upstairs um, for the first time, um, it's been incredibly exciting for me because it is the first time for me to show one of these works, to be able to be so close to one of the larger works. Um, I also went to the um, uh, the storage of the um, Liechtenstein collections or the Liechtenstein group, as I learned they are called, which I thought was interesting. Um, and um, I learned a lot from looking at these two images. Now, the last couple of minutes, I would like to spend talking about um, the project that we developed for the Gemälde Galerie upstairs in this building. Um, we named that project King Vulture. King Vulture, um, because um, it is uh, inspired and uh, focuses around a group of works made by Jan Wenix. Um, you see one of these works on the left hand side. Um, it is owned by the um, Kunsthistorisches here in Vienna. And I'm sure that all of you know it really well, because I think they have it on si on, on display quite often. Um, what you see here is a documentation photo of that work that was sent to me by the Kunsthistorisches. So there's a little color bar on it at the bottom. And on the right hand side, you see Dead Cock by um, Melchior de Hondekoeter. Um, I am super struck by the formal um, analogies between King Vulture and Dead Cock. Um, and at the same time, uh, what I really like about King Vulture is the fact that the vulture, a South American bird that must have been imported from either North Brazil or Suriname to the Netherlands at the time when Jan Wenix painted it, um, that the vulture here um, is able to um, uh, to uh, come out as uh, the victor over this local bird. Uh, interesting and confusing and uh, uh, peculiar, I thought. There are not a lot of images that show this kind of uh, yeah, power relation in this way. Um, so I found that fascinating. Um, there are four works made by Jan Wenix that depict this king vulture. It could be that this bird reached um, his studio... Uh, or that he was able to paint it in the house of an owner of this bird. Um, it could be that it was stuffed, taxidermy. It could also be that it was alive, um, but um, whether it was stuffed or uh, living or dead, um, he always picked it, depicted it in the same position, in the same way that Melchior de Hondekoeter uh, depicted his pelicans in the same position. Um, this work, that is a rather large work, um, you see here, um, is um, at the Alte Pinakothek in München. Um, it is uh, more than three meters high. Um, I tried to get these works together in a room, these two and two other works by Wenix, um, who are all in European collections, um, but it was very difficult. Um, I, the last time I tried was in the framework of... Um, uh, the Steirische Herbst, um, that, uh, the edition that uh, happened last year, uh, I worked together with Ekaterina Degot. Um, we attempted to bring the four works together in one room, um, but we did uh, not succeed. And um, uh, my thoughts around uh, original objects on the one hand um, and all the complexities that come with ownership uh, and lending uh, and loaning, um, and at the same time, um, uh, dynamics around copies, 
uh, and documentation that interests me very much um, led me to wonder whether it could be an idea to develop another way to deal with these objects. Um, it's important to uh, remember that all these objects, made, whether they're made by Falkenburg or Jan Wenix or Melchior de Hondekoeter, it's all decoration, right? Like these are not objects like a, a biblical history or a portrait um, that would find a, maybe a quite prominent place in an interior of an owner of such a work. Um, these works that are made by these artists would rather feature either above a door or um, above a mantelpiece or a fireplace um, or maybe as part of a paneling of a room. Uh, so this piece, this three meter high piece um, uh, was obviously thought for a wall uh, paneling, it's kind of upscale wallpaper, right? Um, so this notion of decoration uh, also feeds into this kind of repetitive uh, dynamic um, that is at work in these works. Um, and here you can see an example of how that functions uh, in an opulent interior um, where these works can find their place um, uh, yeah, as wallpaper rather than um, as... Um, as as paintings um, uh, that are um, how would you say that uh, that are come again? Generation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this space is not um, a um, European uh, home, um, but a uh, American space. Um, Mara Lago, um, a very uh, eclectic interior that makes uh, that was not designed by Donald Trump, by the way. Um, but by the previous owners of that home. Um, and it brings together all sorts of styles, as you can see um, here. Um, Donald Trump, uh, yeah, known uh, uh, to like to flaunt uh, what he owns. Um, and that is what you can see in this image, um, other than his sons who invest in another kind of... Uh, um, like uh, another kind of PR around their uh, self um, uh, stylization. Uh, Donald Jr. on the left hand side, um, who chooses to portray himself as a simple man. And on the right hand side, the other son, Eric, um, on a hunting trip um, in Zimbabwe in 2011. Um, so different con concepts of ownership of uh, possession of um, self-stylization um, of uh, different concepts of land and different ideas around dominance um, over territory, over land, over uh, creatures. Um, this is a inaugurational press conference on the Trump International Golf Course in Dunbeck in Ireland. Um, and here you can see how landscape is subjected to uh, yeah, both fantasies and purposes. Um, here, um, I, this is an associative moment where I just put some images together. These are both images of the Surinamese jungle. Um, on the left hand side, um, a uh, area um, in the Amazon rainforest part of Suriname, North Suriname, um, where gold has been found. And uh, you can see how this industry impacts the landscape, the natural order of things. And on the right hand side, a number of youngsters um, having a rest um, on top of post-colonial industrial waste um, that was left there by Dutch industrialists. Um, Suriname became independent in 1975 rather late. Um, and this is an image, um, an 18th century impression um, of a plantation in, uh, in Suriname named Friendship. Friendship. Um, and here again, you can see how, uh, yeah, the landscape was conceptualized, but these concepts were also uh, put, uh, yeah, produced into a reality. So in the end, um, what you can see now in the Surinamese jungle, the Amazon jungle that came back uh, and overgrew these structures, uh, you can still see the structures underneath. They are right there for everybody to be seen. Very fascinating. Um, this work is a work by Jan Wenix, 
um, that is um, in the National Museum of Budapest. They sent me this photo. I asked them for a documentation photo, and they sent me this photo with, again, on the left-hand side, a color bar uh, that makes it easier to reproduce this image. Um, you can see here the King Vulture, um, other than the other uh, two images you saw uh, in front of a fantasized Italianate landscape um, with some... Um, yeah, classicist uh, uh, remnants and uh, pointers, let's say. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I started to wonder whether for the um, exhibition in Graz, the Starische Herbst, it would be possible to find another way of uh, presenting these images uh, other than bringing the originals together in one room. Um, and I decided to have them copied um, in China, um, where there is a lively industry of copying paintings. Um, and I sent, therefore, um, my uh, documentation images of these four paintings uh, to the studio of uh, Yawi Zhu um, and his team. Um, they work in a studio called the Jungshi Art Studio in Dafen. Dafen is um, an outskirt of the city of Shenzhen. Um, and uh, here you see two of the... Uh, uh, team members um, at work on two of the different works. Um, you can see that the young woman uh, on the left-hand side uh, has a little... Um, uh, has a screen uh, on which she can see um, the image that we sent her. So she uses that image as a lead. Um, and in this manner, uh, four paintings were produced that are now in dis on display upstairs at the gallery, um, together with a number of original works by Wenigs, Falkenburg and Hondekoeter from the collection of the Gemälde Galerie and beyond. Um, these images arrived um, in Graz um, in um, the autumn of last year, right in time for the opening of Steirische Herbst, and this is how they were installed. Um, so you can see that um, the edges of the works, uh, uh, so both uh, the frames of the original paintings and the edges around them that were photographed by the documentation photographers uh, are all painted along, um, and they all became part of the work. The black and white image that is uh, uh, the third uh, to the third on the left, um, uh, the source of that image is a, um, is a photo uh, of a 1985 catalog uh, made by the National Gallery of Dublin in Ireland. Um, they were not able to provide me with another image, so I had to work on the basis of this image, or uh, rather the painters in Dafen had to work with this image, um, and they did. Um, they had a hard time. This image does not contain a lot of information, so it's a rather woolly, blurry interpretation of that painting. Um, what happened in the end? What you're looking at here are, um, yeah, they are, um, they are not paintings of paintings, but they are paintings of photographs, right? Um, here you can see um, the difference between the original. Uh, a nix, a fragment on the left, um, and the Chinese copy on the right-hand side. Um, and here you can see how the installation in Graz relates to the, re uh, the installation that I made at the National Gallery in Berlin 12 years earlier. Honde Kuter on the left and Falk... Um, Venix on the right. What I quite like about this combination of images is that um, uh, the pelican is a bird that reached the Netherlands through the uh, East India Company, um, whereas the vulture must have reached that country via the West India co uh, Company. So two directions of import and transport. Um, thank you. <laughs>